All right, so uh, moving right along in uh, Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy here, uh, we're up to chapter four. And uh, Nietzsche has compressed a lot into these paragraphs. They're extremely dense, uh, and there's a lot more going on in them than meets the eye. That's why uh, a line-by-line -line analysis or a paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph analysis like, like this one is really necessary to illuminate the text. He keeps using this word, naive, um, and that word does not mean what you think that it means. It comes instead from an essay by Schiller, who in 1795 wrote an essay uh, on, on the naive versus the sentimental type of poet or artist. Um, so another one of these Germanic dichotomies. This, uh, by naive, um, Schiller means the, uh, the kind of artist who is primarily concerned with a representation of the outer world. Uh, like epic poets are normally of the, the naive type. Homer is definitely of the naive type. Whereas the sentimental type uh, is self-reflective. And as far as Schiller was concerned, pretty much all the Greeks were of the naive type, with the exception of Euripides uh, for him, which is a significant exception, uh, as we'll see when we get to that point. Um, Tolstoy versus Dostoevsky. Tolstoy is the naive type, the, the epic painter of the, the objective outer world. Dostoevsky is all about his inner world. The danger of the sentimental type is that it, it can get a bit solipsistic. Um, so there's always that danger. Uh, but those are the two types. And so when he uses this word naive, uh, Homer's na naive creation of the Apollinean world, he means it in the sense of an outer epic dream world. Uh, that is being, <coughs> being created. So, and then he brings up Raphael, uh, whom he characterizes as naive. Goethe would be another example of a naive artist, but a lot of the Germans are uh, of the sentimental type. They have a tendency more often to produce, their poets are more of the sentimental type, like Kleist, for instance, is a perfect example of the sentimental type. Uh, Goethe, of the epic, uh, naive type. And he characterizes Raphael here in this paragraph as naive, and he brings up his painting, The Transfiguration. And if you haven't seen this painting, you should, you should pull it up on a Google image search. And he says, here we have the creation. On the bottom half of the canvas, there is an exorcism taking place. A boy is possessed. People are gathered around. They're all anxious, worried, and concerned. He says, this is the Dionysian world of the insight into the abyss. But above it rises Christ with the transfiguration where he apotheosizes him, himself and shows himself forth as a being of light. Um, that's the Apollinean bright world hovering above the abyss that is always below it. Um, so then, now he gets into, there's another dichotomy here that needs to be kept in mind that he gets to, uh, which is the dichotomy between measure versus excess. Uh, Apollo is the god, and the Apollinean world is the god of measure, par excellence, of boundaries. Um, Dionysus, of course, is the god of excess. But the Apollinean motto is, or two of them, know thyself, number one, number two, nothing in excess. And he says that uh, the problem of the fate of most of the protagonists, let's say, of Greek tragedy, is that they have overstepped boundaries of one sort or another. Uh, Oedipus has excessive wisdom. He solved the riddle of the Sphinx. Um, he's transgressed the bounds, hence his fate. Agamemnon in the Oristyle, when he returns from the war, uh, stands there in his chariot boasting about all the great heroic deeds that he performed to, to help win the war and gives none of the credit to the gods. That's overweening pride. Hence his, his fate. So there's always in uh, the Apollinean world of the Greeks, in, by the Greeks, uh, nature pretty much means the Athenians here, as, as we'll see in a moment, uh, who struck this perfect measure. Uh, there are always, there's always a boundary, a bulwark, that's being uh, erected against the excesses of the Dionysian world. Now, there was a book written by um, Lessing, Gotthold Lessing, back in the 18th century, um, called The Laocoon, and it's a great sort of early aesthetic media studies classic where he asks, the book, he starts the book off by asking why it is that in the Laocoon sculpture as we have it, 
Laocoon and his two sons are being attacked by serpents. Um, I believe they've been sent by Apollo, if I remember right. So this is the Apollonian punishment against excess here. Um, and he looks mildly in a state of discomfort, uh, but nothing compared to how Virgil portrays the scene in the Aeneid when, when he describes it happening and he describes Laocoon screaming his head off. So there again we have measure versus excess because uh, Lessing will say that, that you can't do the same thing in painting and, and poetry uh, that, that you can do in sculpture. They have limits. And in sculpture, the reason why Lacuan is not represented as screaming his head off in agony, the way that you, Virgil describes him, is because it's, uh, it's it would be grotesque. The sculpture would be grotesque. It would be unclassical. It wouldn't be beautiful. So there are limits there, once again. Whereas in poetry, you can do that. You don't have the same kind of limits. So it's an early kind of media studies insight that you can't do the same thing in every medium. Each new medium enables you to do something different. And so I think that's some, this, this text is swimming around somewhere in the back of Nietzsche's mind as well uh, as when he talks about this. And he talks about how the, um, th there's the, uh, the pre-Apollinian age is the age of the Titans. And uh, before Zeus takes power over them, they are all punished. Um, this is all described by Hesiod. So by the time Zeus uh, is victorious over all the Titans through the various, the Giganomachy, the Titanomachy, um, and brings in the Apollonian world, then the Homeric world picture stabilizes. Um, and then he says the extra Apollonian world is the realm outside, uh, the realm of the barbarians, who are also given to excesses. And so excess is always the thing that is punished uh, by the Apollonian worldview, by its, its concept of Moira, and Moira itself actually does have a spatial connotation as, as having a boundary. It's fate that defends a boundary. Um, so there's always measure going on here uh, in Greek culture, art, and civilization. And then he moves on to talk about how um, he says the Doric state, which is Sparta, um, the problem with Sparta is that it went too far with the Apollonian and created a bulwark against the Dionysian uh, it's, it's by going too far. It's uh, military discipline, it's prim and proper, unappealing art, uh, is all about the elimination of the Dionysian. That's what you get in a city-state uh, where the Dionysian has just been completely chased off the stage. Uh, it's not there. Uh, whereas the Athenians struck a more fortunate balance uh, between the two. And then he says how um, there are four great epochs that Hellenic history uh, falls into, and, and I think he's referring here to Winkelmann, who in 1764 put out the history of the art of antiquity, and he, Winkelmann is really the first to introduce into art this idea that there are epochs, and this is, remains true of the German mentality uh, on through Goethe, on down to, to Nietzsche, and then ultimately inherited by Spengler, that art unfolds in a series of stages, and Winkelmann said that there were four distinct stages of Greek art. There is the, uh, the pre-culture stage, which is the early culture that leads all the way up to about 450 uh, BC, about up to the time of Phidias. Um, that's the ancient stage. Then there's the high culture stage, which is basically Periclean Athens. This is the time of uh, the creation of all the great sculpture uh, in Periclean Athens. And then there's the uh, third stage, is the merely beautiful stage, where we have Praxiteles and Lysippus coming in to sort of wrap everything up into a nice, neat little bow. And I remember that Spengler compares uh, this phase, Praxiteles and Lysippus, to, in, in our Western classical music, to about the time of Beethoven, um, when the grand classical style of Haydn and Mozart and Steinmetz and Gluck, all those guys would correspond to Winkelmann's high period, uh, and then the Beethoven period uh, begins to sound uh, the first notes of decay a bit. Uh, still beautiful, still classical, but beginning to uh, announce the twilight. And then finally, the fourth phase for Winkelmann is, of course, the Hellenistic period. During the Hellenistic age, pretty much everyone assumed that what had been achieved 
what could be achieved with the, the Greek statuary had already been achieved. And so they created a kind of post-classic art. And I think Bickelmann's model uh, fits very nicely here with pre-classic, uh, classic and post-classic that Mesoamerican archaeologists assign to the, uh, the Mayan civilization. And the same basic phases happen there too as well. And all they could do, the Greeks during the Hellenistic age, was repeat a fixed stock of forms. The great, in other words, the great archive had already been created in the previous three epochs. No more archive could be created as prototypes for uh, new kinds of sculpture and statuary during the Hellenistic period because everything great had already been done and all they could do was look back at the past and churn out uh, uninspired imitations. Pretty much my theory in my book, Post-Classic Cinema, where I wrote about uh, the post-classic phase of cinema coming in with hypermodernity uh, and the complete digitization of cinema, uh, what we get in the epoch of post-classic cinema, right around the year 2000, is nothing but looking back at the great achievements. The Star Wars, it really kicks off with the Star Wars prequels, um, and Francis Coppola trying to go back to the greatness of the two Godfather films with his third Godfather film, which is nothing of the kind, not on the same classical level at all. That really starts the ball rolling in the mid-90s there. I think that film was 95 or 96, something like that. And, um, and one sequel after the next, the Blade Runner sequel, the Mad Max sequel, the this sequel, the that sequel, it's all these directors realizing that um, this is a depleting medium. Cinema is not, the media are not infinite. They do not contain an infinity of potential reserve power. Um, and these directors are realizing in post-classic cinema that we're running out of potentialities for cinema. So they go back and they repeat what's already been done and try to at least equal it or surpass it. Some of them are pretty good. The, the Blade Runner sequel, for instance, was, was pretty darn good. Nothing like the original, but uh, as sequels go, and the Mad Max Fury Road film was very good as well. So occasionally they do manage to harken back a bit to the former glory when cinema was at its high phase, in its beautiful phase, um, exactly analogous to Winkelmann's theory here. So Winkelmann was the first to bring in this idea uh, that art unfolds through stages. And now Nietzsche ends this chapter by wanting to know what the telos, there is a goal here that is being worked out, and it will be worked out in the creation of Attic Tragedy and the dramatic Dithyram. Um, and that will unfold the, the telos of Greek art here in its Apollinean perfect balance. Yeah, for him, it can't just be the Apollinean. It has to, the Apollinean must contain the Dionysian in it as well. There has to be a balance between, the, between measure and excess. Uh, so we'll see how that works out.